Hello everyone and welcome to the Gamers In. I'm your host this week, Ryan Murphy. And uh, Jocelyn's not here tonight, she's not feeling very well, so filling in this evening is Kristen. Kristen, how are you doing? I am doing wonderful tonight, Ryan. How are you doing? <laughs> we're so pumped. We're so pumped. I'm doing well. Uh, we're doing a show. Technical difficulties aside, I'm just getting ahead of it. Because you never know. Streaming, it's happening. You just got to get ahead of it and knock on some like wood and just, okay, we're good. But no, this is the Gamers In. We're going to talk about video games. And it kind of crossed my mind lately that Halloween is like tomorrow. It, it's not tomorrow, but it's coming up. It's very soon. Uh, so we're going to talk about some scary games because I know you're into scary games. I love scary games. I love the horror genre in general. Books, movies, games, mm -hmm. you name it. I love it. Nice. Well, we're going to talk about that. And that's basically going to dominate the whole show. Uh, and of course, we'll probably talk about heroes in there a little bit. How could we not talk about heroes with uh, with Kristen here? But we're going to we're going to start off the show with Gears of War. We're going to get out of the way. The big release this week, Gears of War 4. Big I, I don't want to say I'm a huge fan of Gears of War because that with that comes with like this I don't know Gears of War started as this like dude bro shooter to end all dude bro shooters where like the guy had the the do rag I think they call it or it's not a and he has the goatee too right uh, and they're shooting and they're high five and they're going woo and you know uh, they're killing the aliens and stuff but it kind of progressed from there they added more story added more characters and now we've got. Gears of War 4, a whole new development team. Uh, the original creators have all but left on, and they've they got I think they got one guy to come back and kind of steer the ship. Uh, and it's it's a good return to form. I'm I'm really enjoying it. But we talked pre-show uh, about your experience with Gears in the past, and you have not played a Gears game before, correct? I have not. And mm -hmm. like you said in the beginning, I initially thought it was just a dude bro shooter, but we're talking about on earth battlefields you know nothing crazy but then the preview at uh, the recent e3 there were aliens and not only aliens but different types of aliens they were talking about nests they were blowing up parts of the map in order to create distractions they were launching things into the air blowing mm -hmm. those up so they could burn the aliens below it was a complex game that seemed more sci-fi than dubro is is that how it's always been? Uh, so yeah, it is. It is pretty sci-fi. Uh, the first three games sort of revolve around a, a group of ragtag shooters trying to basically save the Earth from these things. I think they call the locusts. I, I, I think they're called the locusts or the swarm. They're basically in the first game they start off as just this mindless swarm that just is trying to obliterate humanity. And then in 2 and 3, they sort of get around to kind of being like, oh, there's a little more to these guys. There's some in central intelligence, as there always is when a swarm is featured in a sci-fi story. But uh, And then, you know, it wraps up and it's like, okay, we've tied a bow on it. The trilogy is done. You don't have to come back. All is well. He takes his, his dude bro rag off and he goes, ah, I could finally rest easy. Um, but it is more sci-fi than than just dude bro. There's a, there's a lot of guys. There, there's a lot of beefy guys running around, but they're you're killing like aliens, I think. But they're not really aliens. They're like aliens from underground, if that makes any sense. Oh, okay. So does it take place on Earth then? I think it. I don't think they call it Earth. They call it like Sarah or something. But it's it's like an Earth-like planet. Okay, so kind of like in Starcraft, um, how they have what Mars Sarah? Yeah, is basically. one of the planets. Mm -hmm. it's it's weird I, I mean at a certain point it's kind of like really guys can't we just call it earth they don't reference earth so i guess it's just this alternate it, it's not at all tied to like our reality it's just this story taking place on a fake planet and and so on and so forth but i uh i really appreciate that they're bringing the series back because you know when your favorite franchise goes away because it's quote unquote ended you're like, oh, that's a little, it's a bit of a bummer. I'm not going to get to play that style of game again. It's nice that the developers get to move on, but I don't know. It's kind of a, it's kind of a letdown a little bit. Um, I'm trying to think like an example, like if, if Blizzard doesn't go back to StarCraft 2, that would be a bit of a bummer, I think, in my opinion. Um, but they, they, you know, Microsoft you know, wants their money. So they basically brought the franchise and then bought a team to build the game and, Usually a scenario like that doesn't quite work out, but I, I think this time it has. They've they've built a really solid structure. The gameplay is all there. It looks fantastic. Uh, the story is an interesting continuation of the series where it's like, I think, 25 years later and you're 
playing, and this isn't a spoiler, it's in the trailer, you're playing as the son of the main character in the first game. Uh, and there's some awesome moments between those characters and you kind of get to, you get a sense of their relationship and how that relationship has sort of like clum crumbled over the last 20 years. It's it's interesting. It's, there's a lot of like father-son, I hate you type moments and... <laughs> You know, classic, video games. right? Classic part of science fiction. From it, Star yeah. Wars to Gears of War, father son conflict. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's a lot. There's no like arm cutting, although I guess in that scene someone does lose an arm, but it's a bad guy, so it's all good. Uh but now I'm I'm really enjoying it. I uh it's available on Xbox and PC. So that's that's a kind of a first for the series where they're launching a new title day and date on PC and Xbox, which is kind of exciting for those who don't have an Xbox One. I don't know if you're, are you a console gamer? I know you're a PC gamer, but... I was back in the day, mm -hmm. but ever since, I think ever since the PlayStation 3 released, I've moved more toward console just because everything can be kept on console and pretty much everything can be played there. And then Steam has the library. Blizzard has its own library. Mm -hmm. It's just so convenient. Yeah. One thing I've run across with uh, with my PC gaming time is that I'll find I'm not even loading Steam up. I'm, I've just got the Battle.net launcher and I'm all right, what do I have time for two hours today? Let's play a little WoW, let's play a little Heroes. Uh, it's kind of tempting to not go anywhere outside of that universe because it's just so easy and there's so many different experiences there. So I I know a lot of folks that uh, that are PC gamers, like the, it's just a, it's a bounty on PC. So why would I, you know, why would I water down my experience with a box that can only play games that are in this green package? Like, ah, that's not fun. Uh, but I know I really appreciate uh, the the gears gears coming back. They've done it really well, and and they've handled it well in a sense where if you hadn't played the original games, you could jump into four if you were interested in checking the game out. Because well, first and foremost, uh, the game launches if you buy a, a game around launch time, it's going to come with a code for the first four games. There was three and then a spinoff, so you'll get all those, and they're available to play on your Xbox One, no problem. Um, and I think I own them all already from a previous like promotion. So if anyone needs the Gears games on Xbox One, you know, write in and let me know. Uh, but also the prologue works really well where you get to play through some of the key story points in the game. You get like pre-Locusts, the, the Locusts just starting out and the Locusts kind of like being defeated. And it gives you that, that chunk of storyline so you can jump right into the new story. So that's... It, they've handled it in a very elegant way where if you wanted to just keep trucking along, you know the story. But if you want to go back and experience it all, you can without actually having it ruined for yourself. Besides the fact that you know that the good guys win, which, I mean, come on. <laughs> the good guys always win in video games. Pretty much. I mean, unless it's one of those really deep video games that makes you question, are you the good guy or <laughs> are you the bad guy? It's true. Like The Last of Us or... Uh, Trying to think of another game that may have been artsy enough. I don't know. Firewatch? Are you the bad guy in Firewatch? It depends. It depends who you ask. I don't know. Uh, I can't remember now. But uh, yeah. Oh, maybe God of War potentially? Yeah. You do a lot of killing in God of War. Kill a few gods? That's not always good it's, for bad. <laughs> that's not kosher, I don't think. I think killing a bunch of gods is not, not a good thing to do. Uh, God of War. Yeah. I don't know. Probably. You do kill a lot of... Uh, high-powered beings and not just the ones that are like kind of dicks you kill them all you know I, I i think that yes that would qualify as a bad as you playing the bad guy but uh yeah gears 4 it's fantastic i probably have more to say on it next week i've only really been able to play a few hours but uh yeah dude bro sci-fi it's back and it's good and if you are a fan of gears then you'll immediately be a fan of this new game they, they've done a great job at continuing the Chainsaw Gun Massacre. It's been a lot of fun. But uh, speaking of uh, Chainsaw Massacre, let's talk <laughs> about horror games. One of the best, one of the better horror movies out there. Yeah. Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yeah, I, I actually have seen that one. I have not seen, I've seen a lot of the older horror movies and I've seen not a couple of the newer ones, but I've, I've missed out on like maybe 15 years of the last horror movies. It's, I've only really watched up to like, the late 80s, because that's where it was 
really creepy. They get really good with prosthetic uh, prosthetic costumes and stuff. And yeah. then they start to get in, like, the really crappy CG and, and you know, fake, super fake blood. And like, ah, you know, I don't know. But but let, let's talk a bit about horror games. Halloween's two weeks away. Uh, this was actually Jocelyn's idea. She had suggested that we talk about uh, some some scary games because it's October. And, you know, let's stop talking about other you know, elections and all that. Let's talk about real horror stories. Oh, wait. No, let's talk about spooky games. You are a big fan of spooky games. I know that because uh, you stream a lot of them. I, I see the Twitch notifications pop up during the day while I'm at work and, and you're sitting there playing some amazing games. So I want to hear about some of these scary games you're playing. Certainly. So usually the scary games are saved for Saturday night. And that just oh, okay. started out as a fun thing because, uh, you know, it's Saturday night, Saturday night spooks. It works. Oh, There's yes. alliteration. We've got it. Uh, so since that started, we've been through Amnesia, Soma, Ooh. Call of Cthulhu, Fatal Frame, Crimson Butterfly, the third Fatal Frame, uh, and the Outlast. And everyone's super excited for the next Outlast. And then on my own time... One of the classics, Silent Hill 2. Oh. Yeah, that's a that's a good smattering of, of scary games. Now, Soma is interesting. I, I want to talk about that one because I've played a little bit of it. And it is... Uh, it's, it's part scary, but then it's mostly like psychological, like thriller type stuff. Where, I don't know, I, I, I'm, I was early on and I, I think I maybe got like halfway. It felt more like isolation scary type stuff and then when the monsters were popping around they were just like walking tin cans and you just had to avoid them and then when they got you it just kind of like i don't know like faded to black it didn't really do anything although i'm i again didn't get very far but am i wrong in that or it there are different sections so there are different mm -hmm. types of monsters you run into and you're absolutely right about not, not that you're wrong how you feel, right? It's how you feel about it. Because certain parts are going to be scary for certain people. Other parts, not so much. Because we all fear different things. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, Soma, there are great, great moments. Wonderful ideas. The, the setup is an absolutely beautiful game. You go deeper and deeper into the ocean. Which that alone for some people is scary. Mm -hmm. uh, but story-wise, they did tried to get a bit too heady so there were revelations that were then repeated so you didn't really care too much and then there was a monster at the end that you had to defeat that had nothing to do with the overall plot so <laughs> it was kind of like yeah I didn't realize okay. it yeah so this is by the guys who did Amnesia which is kind of heralded as the scary game uh, and it, it, do you feel like someone was kind of like a dip down for them and, you know, trying to dip their toes in other pools of water, but, you know, not really what you were expecting as a fan of their other works, like Amnesia or... That is a great question because I actually played Amnesia after Soma, mm -hmm. and I would agree that at the moment, Amnesia is their, their best horror game by far that I've played. Um, Soma, in regards to horror, I think is a step up. They really, really pushed the envelope in terms of sound, lighting, design, that kind of stuff. But I think they tried to do story, but it wasn't quite there. So that kind of threw off the feeling. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I can, I, can, I can feel that for sure. And I'm a big fan of anything that reminds me of Bioshock and being underwater in sort of a facility... It, it just checks that box of like, yep, you're underwater, there's leaky pipes, boom, you are in Bioshock Town. And that's that's some good vibes right there. Uh, I have not finished it. It's been on one of those, that list of, if I were to dabble in scary games, that's the one I would want to finish first. Now, you mentioned also Silent Hill. The only Silent Hill game I played through was one on Wii. And it was actually really cool because it was it uses the it used the Wiimote speaker as kind of like a phone sometimes, and you'd have to put it up to your ear and it, it would whisper things. It was super creepy, and uh, <laughs> the whole point of the game was basically there's no combat. You just had to run from the bad guys, and I I can't for the life of me remember how you ran. I I you know default reaction is like you did this with the Wiimote but I don't think that was the case that might just be like waggle Ryan thinking about how this worked 
But uh, I do remember a mechanic where you'd have to basically run away and uh, you'd have to choose your path and like go through doors and stuff. It was, it felt very scripted, but it was also very cool in that like, okay, if they're not going to do combat, they're going to lean into the fact that you're just, you are super fragile and you have to get away from these monsters. And it was freaky because as soon as those things were coming after you, you knew if you were going to get caught, you were going to be dead and it would have to start over. Uh, so you would, if you're booking it, you're booking it. Uh, I can't remember what it was called. I think it was called like Silent Hill Shattered Memories. And it was a Wii exclusive. Uh, if you ever, if you have a Wii, check it out. It, it's really neat if you're a big fan of that franchise. And isn't that the entire crux of a great horror game though? And a horror, the horror genre in general, right? Because it's all about emasculating you mm -hmm. as the person putting yourself in this fiction universe. Because if you have power, it's not that scary because you can find a way out. But if it strips you of all power whatsoever, so for instance, like you were saying, you have to run away from these monsters, suddenly things are a lot creepier. Just. Yeah. 10 times more horrifying. Yeah, you you had to run away. You you could not fight. And I think, yeah, you couldn't fight at all. Like maybe there was some escape mechanics. Like if something did get a hold of you, you had like a a way of escaping, but and you had a health bar. It was a long time ago. I, I remember renting it and thinking like, ah, Silent Hill on Wii. Like, what is this? And it actually turned out to be a very good game. And um, I don't know. You'd probably have to like go to EB Games or something or, or uh, GameStop, I guess, and pick it up used. That's if you can if you can find a copy. But uh, have you tried the Outlast 2 demo? Because the Outlast 2 is coming out next year, is it not? It should. It was originally going to release this fall, but I didn't know the demo was out already. Speaking of games where you can't fight and you have to run away from things. Yeah, yeah. I stopped playing that game. I could not. There's a video that I did from Extra Life a couple years ago where uh, we had uh, where we where I played that game like at three or four in the mor morning and I had James Bartholomew with me and this British voice in the back of my head who had been up for an extra six hours because he's he's in London and he's like, oh, don't worry, Ryan, just keep on moving. I can't I'm doing a terrible British accent, but uh, it was it was an experience and I got maybe an hour in. I'm like, nope. I can't do this anymore, <laughs> not at four in the morning, and I never went back. I just kept replaying the video every year, like, it's a pizza break, watch Ryan piss his pants, you know? So you finished that game, you finished it last? Yep, finished it, and then we played the, oh the DLC as well. Oh, uh, you did? And is the DLC, like, creepier? I would say yes, okay. and mostly because of this one single character that they added, and what he does to you before you're able to break free of his grasp and run away. Oh my gosh. Uh, so, I can't believe I'm going to say this. Do I add Outlast to the list of games? Because I've been kind of thinking it'd be really cool to cover like a new horror experience each week on Gamers In as we lead up to uh, the inevitable event of Halloween. Uh, is Outlast something I put back on my list as a game like, I go back to? I would say yes. Mm. Uh, I mean, me and then everyone there who watched it, we just had a fantastic time getting through that game. Okay, I'm trying to remember. I think I got I got to the part where we were in the prison with the people with their units hanging out. I think that's where I stopped. And I was like, this is really, this is really weird. I, I don't know. I don't know if I want, I don't know if I can go forward with this. This is, it's just one of those things. Like, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I'm sure it gets worse because I've heard things about the game. It's a big psychological type uh, thing. And uh, man, French Canadians, I think it are, are the guys who made that game. Uh, they're from Quebec and whew. I think you're right too. And but but let me say this: if mm -hmm. you like science fiction horror, get to the end of that game. It it was completely unexpected, and oh. it was amazing. I loved the ending of Outlast. It really was the bow on the package of how great that game was. Okay. Oh, all okay. right. Well, I will I will make an effort to at least boot it back up and see because it's a shorter ish game, right? I believe. Correct. It's not too too long. I think it took us three Saturdays to complete. And that's, of course, uh, making up for all of the deaths and everything and having to repeat certain areas. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I will I will check it out. And I think I have the DLC somewhere, like, on some platform. And 
There'll probably be a Halloween sale because that's how Steam works. But uh, Asrin5 in the chat room is saying Until Dawn is a game that he has a hard time watching. And I will say, the last scary game that I really appreciated and probably the best horror movie I've ever seen was Until Dawn, which is a video game on the PlayStation 4. And again, like if, if you have a chance to get your hands on a PS4, Until Dawn should be the first game you pick up because that game is like playing through scream the movie uh it's really cool and there's some some great mechanics and it's got it's all uh, uh mo-capped so it's it's like actual actors it's got uh hayden penitentiary which is not uh, Pey peyton <laughs> penitentiary. <laughs> it's not penitentiary for the horror game right that's how yeah. she goes it, that's that's like her horror episode name. exact exactly you saw where i was going with this and then it's got the guy from agents of shield the 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 evil dude, the guy who turns evil, spoiler, I don't know, but he, there's a lot of amazing experiences in Until Dawn, and it totally riffs on some of my favorite uh, horror movie uh, genres, uh, like slasher, and there's a little bit of, like, monster, and there's a little bit of, like, saw in there, and, oh, it's so good. It, even to go watch a playthrough, I think Jocelyn actually played through the whole thing. It's on her YouTube channel. Totally worth checking out. Um... Yeah, Call of Cthulhu. I've never played that one before. Is it? Uh, what's that like? Nowadays, it's old. It is very dated, and even on the computer, it is buggy. But if you like the Cthulhu mythos and you really enjoy that that aura that Lovecraft can create in his writing, Call of Cthulhu: Dark Corners of the Earth is arguably the best Cthulhu game that has ever been made. It really does capture hmm. that world. And when I played through it, I mean, the bad guys aren't too scary. There are a few jump scares that might get you. But there was this build up toward the old gods. And when you see them and you see a picture of the design, of course it's not scary, but the build up in the notes and the books that you find along the way was superb. Hmm. I mean, mentally, I was I was shaking in my boots to go into this wind tunnel where I knew they were. Right. Because you had mentioned that you're into horror uh, books as well. So I think that you would be the type of player that when they present to you like a codex, when you pick up a book in game, you're going to read that thing and you're going to absorb it. And I felt like, uh, uh, like the Soma, the Amnesia games are right up your alley in that sense where there's a lot of written text that you can sort of pour over. And uh, yeah, I'm uh, I'm not I'm not super familiar with Cthulhu. I'll be the first, I'll be I'll admit it. I don't know anything about Cthulhu. I know he's like a, a squid monster, I think. Something like that. He's yeah. I mean, there are, there are descriptions, right? But he's he's so horrifying. You really cannot mentally grasp what it is. Mm -hmm. It will drive you insane. Oh, is that his power? He will just drive you insane as you try to like count his tentacles. It's one of the powers, and I mean, <laughs> how many are on there? I don't God, know. I can't even count jelly beans in a jar. <laughs> but there's this great moment where you're in a room with a statue of Cthulhu, and you can't look at the statue because if you do, you start to go insane. And the longer you're in that room, the closer you get to insanity, and eventually, when you hit insanity, of course, you have to reset from where you were, where you saved last. Oh, no. Okay. Um, have you ever played... That reminds me of a game I played. Probably one of the my favorite horror games, or at least my uh, favorite horror experiences, was... Um, what was it called? It was by Silicon Knights. It was Eternal Darkness on GameCube. And fantastic game. You, you probably wouldn't be able to find it anywhere. That company is so defunct now that it would be impossible to get a hold of that game. But uh, Eternal Darkness on GameCube was, I think... It was a launch title or a round launch title for GameCube, and it was a game where you played a character that went to a mansion, and you were jumping to different characters in a di in the timeline to kind of experience. I don't know if they were like related to you or or something. And there was an insanity meter, and some of the insanity meters were basically you'd be walking through a room, and then your your GameCube would like fake a save malfunction, <gasps> and then it would say like. Oh, you, your save has been corrupted. Please restart your GameCube. And it would look exactly like the screen. It was awesome. Uh, it would say your controller is disconnected. Uh, it, would, it would fake like a TV input change. It was, it was really meta and really like out of the box type thinking to kind of get you psychologically like messed up. And 
uh, one thing that really kept with me is I, I was playing like a you play like a Benjamin Franklin type character, like a bigger historical looking dude from from back in the day. And you're just walking through a room exploring, and all of a sudden, like your head explodes, and then your limbs start exploding, and you're like, oh. "What is happening?" It's a really cool game, and again, uh, if you can get your hands on it, totally worth playing. Uh, if not, check it out on YouTube, Eternal Darkness. It's it's really good. So uh, about those the TV mechanics and sure. the, the corrupted save file, how did you get past those? I mean, what what was the mechanic to defeat that? I guess the uh, evil GameCube. From yeah, the evil GameCube. I think really it was just a mechanic to kind of throw you off as a player because eventually, if you were patient enough, it would just go away, and oh, okay. and you would come back and. Uh, I remember every time it happened. Now I was younger when it came out, maybe, gosh, probably 15 years ago. So when I was playing it, I was, you know, a little more impressionable than I am now. So if the TV input was broken, we'd be like, oh my God, fix it. And it would always be in a moment where, you know, the, the music's tension-y and you're like thinking, oh, there's monsters around the corner. And there was combat in the game, so you would have to fend off uh, monsters and stuff. But it was really cool. You played as like a gladiator from Rome. Um... Uh, some other some other characters as well. I think you were, um, uh, yeah. It's been a long time, but you there, you were definitely a Benjamin Franklin type character, and definitely an, uh, a knight from from the Roman era. It was really really unique. Just unfortunately, they never got around to making another one, which is unfortunate. Uh, but um, uh, to Loro, I'm sure the T is silent, is asking: Is Dead Space considered horror? Now, please tell me you've played Dead Space, because that oh, is an amazing... Yeah, come on. Yes, Good. yes, I had to. That was definitely a streamed game. Um, as for is it is it horror or not, um, me personally, I think it is half horror, half shooter, because they give you the weapons to defeat the monsters. So while things pop out and scare you, it's not like um, uh, what we were talking about earlier, Silent Hill, mm -hmm. where you have to run away because these things will kill you. But at the same time, some people are horrified of aliens, horrified of space. So therefore, that means it is a legitimate horror game, regardless of how many uh, Ripper Blades you have. Yeah, I think I think the first one it is very safe bet to throw that in the horror category. As you move forward in the game, I think 2 still had that like psychological horror where the control was taken away from you as a player, or at least the only control you were given was just mash A, you know, to kind of get out of the whole, like, your eye is about to be poked open. Uh, but the first one, you know, you mentioned, like, aliens. There's also, like, human disfiguration, like, mutations. Like, that could be... I know that's a big one for me in terms of, like dead space that it got to me on a lot of layers like space you're alone the only thing you have the way it set up sort of your weapon system being uh the tools of the trade like you were using tools that you would use and and to that effect it's kind of like just give me a gun and they i think they eventually they didn't give you a gun in the first one but in the second one they give you like something that acts as if it was a gun but you still felt kind of helpless in that game where you're like really all i have is this you know, weird thing that switches back and forth and shoots rivets, and which was the best weapon in the game. But uh, yeah, I really like Dead Space, and I appreciate folks who get upset when Dead Space 2 and 3 enter the conversation, especially 3, because I know a lot of folks weren't very happy with 3 and how it went more action-focused. But I really appreciated all those games, and i a little bummed that they're not going to be making any more anytime soon. Like, if they announced Dead Space 4 or Dead Space Reboot, I'd be all over it. Uh, but unfortunately, it looks like EA is more content with those people making Star Wars games. So, which is, you know, I, I guess that's cool. The moneymaker, right? And yeah. Dead Space 3, I, I understand the action point. But what really shined in that game, I thought, was the co-op. Yeah. It was incredible. I would be so down for a, a legitimate, entirely co-op Dead Space 4 because the horror elements that they pulled in while well, I was going insane, and then uh, Kyle, I was playing with him, he was trying to defend off the necromorphs that were running as I was just standing there fighting my own battle in some weird dimension. It was so cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, th they did They did really add to that co-op, and it was... A lot of people were worried that, oh, you're adding co-op, that's going to take away from the horror element because, like you said, it, it sort of 
I know the game doesn't do it, but co-op in general, it's giving you more power because you're then with other people. But that game takes away that, like, just as much as it gives you that power, it takes it away so quickly. Like with those insanity infect- effects where I think, unfortunately, I, I only had a chance to play it alone. But when I would when I did play it once with a friend, it was like, oh, my God, did you see that? I'm like, no, you were just standing there kind of like freaking out. <laughs> exactly. Or you walk into a room, everything looks normal for player one, but you see your dead son's old birthday decorations everywhere and mm-hmm. you're freaking out because they're like, what's going on, man? Looks fine. Yeah. And you're on, on you're on voice chat and you're kind of going back and forth. You're right. That game, uh, man, I wish it sold more because honestly, I would have loved a Dead Space 4 and I'm pretty sure that game ended on a weird note and then when you play the DLC, or no, it was anticlimactic and then if you play the DLC, you basically get like, no, this is the weird ending and we could totally do a 4 where you battle space moons. Like, I, I'm pretty sure that was the ending to that game. But I can't Something remember. like that. I remember reading it. I don't remember much of uh, the <laughs> Dead Space 3 ending, which I think says, <laughs> Probably. says something about the ending itself. But I think I was reading the lore somewhere, and you're right about the, the evil moons. The living moons. No. It, that's no moon. I don't know. I, I think that uh, it would have been great to get Dead Space 4, and I feel like maybe they, they saw the writing on the wall, and they're like, we get one more DLC package and then EA is shipping us off to Battlefield and Star Wars. So let's just make it Evil Moons. Everyone will freak out. And then, hey, maybe down the road after we make a couple Battlefields, we'll be able to make Dead Space 4. Uh, I just really appreciated those games. I like I like good action games. Uh, so, yeah, I wish there was more. It was kind of very much in the, in the vein of uh, Uncharted, where it was those big set pieces, especially 2 and 3. But... Uh, so, what other what other horror games have been keeping you busy? Well, scary games, I guess. Well, one of the scariest I played myself actually on stream, and this is a game that dates back to college. Mm. Fatal Frame Crimson Butterfly. This is the mm. second of the Fatal Frame games, and it is Japanese horror at its finest. And the whole plot is you and your sister find this abandoned village, and you start searching through it and as you're searching you find a camera and it turns out you can only kill the ghosts by holding up the camera and taking pictures of them Mm -hmm. and back in college i tried we were gonna switch off we had all the lights off we had some popcorn and i tried the first round and i threw the controller out of fear and my roommate picked it up and said no more for you and finished it so (sighs) Yeah, those controllers are expensive. I mean, more so now, but uh, yeah, I, the only experience I've had with Fatal Frame is there was a demo, a Wii U exclusive Fatal Frame game, and it was, it was, yeah, I could see it getting really creepy. It was really weird where you had to use the camera and you were basically like moving the gamepad around, and as you're moving the gamepad around, you're not really seeing what's on screen because you're focused on the camera, and then you'd be moving around and you're like, oh my god, there's a ghost. And if you throw that controller, like, that's like a six-month wait period from Nintendo. Like, you're not getting another one of those anytime soon. Uh, but uh, you, so this this one you played back in college, this this sequel, have you played any of the other ones that have come out, or are you just more of a fan of the, the older releases in that series? I did. I played two, and then I heard three was really good. And so we played through three, and three was interesting because unlike the second one where you're put in a village that you have to explore and unlock the secrets of, this one gives you your home as the main base of operation. And every time you go to bed, that's when you go into a dream world that you have to explore. Now, while I think two is still the better Three had some incredible moments because you know, you just know your home is slowly going to be invaded by ghosts. You hear things after a while. You see feet where there shouldn't be feet. You see things darting behind you in the mirror. There's blood. And then you look again, the blood's gone. It's, it was, whew, it was an experience. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. I didn't get very far. I think uh, the one on Wii U is kind of like, suicide mountain or something i think was the 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 story which is kind of i guess a real place uh where people kind of go and yeah yeah there's a it's the yeah um i think over a hundred people commit suicide every year in this forest and it's it's taped off and there are signs that say please think of your loved ones kind of thing 
Oh, wow. Really? Okay. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, you know, I got to hand it to Japanese culture. They really like take the real world aspects of things and just run with them because that game, that game just has that creepy moments. And I'm sure there's a couple of like moments in it that are like, haha, remember it's a Japanese culture game and you have a camera and the ghosts are kind of like, ooh, weird. But uh, I, um, I, I can appreciate, I, I love playing games that are outside of our, our cultural norm. And that's probably one of those franchises um, you know, that hasn't been Americanized. Like Resident Evil, very Americanized. Like if you're gonna play that game, like you're playing the the Japanese idea of a, an American B horror film, right? And they really layer that on. And I don't know, like uh, I've I've played the newest Resident Evil demo, Resident Evil Seven, and that was more in line with Outlast. Very freaky. I don't know if I want to play that game. <laughs> It's uh, it's you're in a you're in a house and you're sort of exploring and there's weird things around, and yeah, yeah, yeah. the one where you just walk in that loop forever. Yeah. yeah. Oh my goodness, yes. Yeah, that 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 was P. Yeah, I think that one was PT, but that was also one of those things. It's like first person horror. I'm getting out of here. Like I don't think I don't even think I beat that game. I just couldn't, I couldn't beat it because I was like not interested in, in even going through that loop one more time with a weird baby in the sink not not cool uh <laughs> but uh yeah we can we can certainly talk about that oh hachikumo in the chat room mentions resident evil plus vr which brings me to my next question as a huge fan of horror games are you interested in making the leap to vr because that sort of comes hand in hand right it does, and I am absolutely 100% for it, but my only stipulation is I have to have one of those movement things that locks me in place. Otherwise, I'm going to jump back into the wall. I'm going <laughs> to be knocking stuff around. I need I need to be locked into basically a baby crib for that <laughs> so we can have a safe, scary time together. <laughs> you just need an extra large belt, and you just strap it around your office chair. You get buckled in. And you're good to go. I actually, uh, today was the first day I've finally been able to pull out. I have a Rift for work, and I finally got a chance to play around with it and put my put the headset on. And it's, you know, it's immersive enough, but there's a little bit of, like, light leakage, I think, so you can, you know, breathe uh, through your nose. If you were to turn off the lights and play a horror game in VR, that... And I didn't think that the, the, the speakers would be very good. They just kind of, they, they feel like flaps that go over your ears. But they are, they are some really good speakers uh, on that thing. So if you were to play something with the Oculus Rift, I feel like even if you're just sitting there playing with a controller, that would be freaky because you've basically got the screen right in front of your face and the game can get, if you know it's being built for VR, it can get creative in ways of basically putting something behind you and then having you move. And as soon as your head starts to move, it's like, boom, like that monster is in front of your face. Uh, and I'm almost worried to say that I have a VR headset and I am interested in playing horror games because I know people are going to be writing in and saying, Ryan, you need to play. It's Halloween after all. Yeah, but I really like don't want to literally, like you said, jump out of my seat and just have this bookcase come down on me. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Just start punching anything, and your wife comes in to check on you. Boom! So, oh my goodness! Well, Honey, I'm so sorry. I was playing today, and they basically, when you set it up, they give you the sort of the demo of, you know, okay, now that you've got it set up, here are some of the experiences. And then, you know, there's, oh, you're on a, um, you're in a room, and then oh, you're on the moon, and there's an alien, and that was kind of freaky. And then oh, you're at the top of a building, and when you look down, it's like you're 80 stories up, and that's. And I was kind of, I was, I found myself like literally going, oh my, oh wow, oh gosh, okay, skip. <laughs> but uh, I, I would be interested, and I'll throw it out there, if someone has a suggestion for not like just, just a scare your pants off game, because it's got to be interesting. I don't think, I don't want to play something that's just like a... Five Nights at Freddy's. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I know there's lore there. I know there is lore there, there is. but I know it's pretty much built on jump scares. It's just built to scare you. I don't want something that's built to basically like make me throw a work device across the room. I just want to see something. And even if it's just like a quick 20 minute virtual experience kind of testing, because that's what most of the good experiences are in VR. It's kind of like just testing the waters because it's very expensive to make a AAA game for something that hardly nobody owns because 
I mean, there are more Wii U's out there than VR systems. I, I, I don't know that for a fact, but I mean, probably. Man, that would suck for Nintendo if there were more <laughs> virtual headsets than uh, than we use out there. That would be a bad statistic. Someone will probably correct me on that. But uh, yeah, I, I'm interested in in checking that out. And I haven't played I haven't played many games. I've just been experimenting with sort of the multimedia mechanics, which is what we're using it for. But uh, yeah, it's in. So what are you looking at in terms of a headset? Are you thinking of maybe aiming towards the console aspect with the PlayStation VR, or are you looking more of the Rift Vive uh, section? I actually haven't looked into it yet. I mm -hmm. think as long as it works and as long as there are there is a decent selection of games, that's really all that matters to me. Yeah, I think when it comes to games, I would probably, like in my limited knowledge in, uh, on VR and the topic of VR, like the PlayStation VR, I think has the most amount of complete game experiences. Uh, I've heard the Vive is very good technologically wise, and the Rift is sort of in the middle there, where the technology is really good, but they're still adding other components to make it catch up with the Vive. But from what I've heard of the PlayStation VR, like Sony's supporting it really well. It's not as good technology wise, but it's it's there solidly with the with the games they're throwing out. And Resident Evil Seven will be. Uh, a VR title on PlayStation. Uh, so there you go. You got your horror built in. And I'm sure Outlast 2 will probably be VR. I'd have to look into that. But they'd be crazy not to. Like, if you're building a horror game, man, slap some VR on that thing. Like, yeah, you got to, right? Exactly. And especially if it's not a horror game where you have to interact directly with the horror models that are there, right? Because mm -hmm. I'm sure that takes a lot more um, programming know-how than simply walking through a story. It's, it's basically like walking through a haunted house, right? Mm -hmm. Or, um, or uh, what was it, Halloween Horror Nights at Universal Studios. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, think that, uh, I think that that's what most of the horror experiences will be, like sort of like a guided experience. Because I think the more, what it, from what I've heard with VR, the more control you put in the person's hands, uh, more likely your audience is gonna get sick playing the game because if you're if you move weirdly and it doesn't jive with what your brain's thinking it's like oh gosh uh, and someone had actually I, I can't remember where I heard it but someone was actually saying no the reason people get sick in VR is because it's your brain it's like a natural instinct like a, a protection of some kind to I don't know yeah uh, probably look it up but actually maybe not look it up because then you probably won't <laughs> want to get a VR headset uh, but, but we're going to talk more scary games, specifically uh, Halloween-themed events in the topic. But first, we're going to take a break, and we're going to talk about the Amu store. There's two stores that you can go to, two. And uh, one is etched.amu.tv, which has a bunch of cool glassware with uh, TGI logo, Amu, other Amu show logos on your wine glass, uh, your your pint glass, your your coffee mug, all kinds of fun stuff. And then there's also shirts.amu.tv, where you can get awesome shirts like the angry chicken and into the nexus and soon the gamers in so check that out i haven't actually been to it in a while they might have actually added them already but uh check those links out bookmark them and come on right back because we're going to talk about halloween themed events specifically sort of influenced by the fact that overwatch has sort of put out their huge i don't know smattering of halloween goodness uh i don't know if you're are you, you're an overwatch player are you not I am, but the most nubbish Overwatch player you'll probably ever meet. Oh, well, then we're going to get along famously because I'm terrible at Overwatch as well. Not that I'm calling you terrible, but I'm terrible. Oh, no, I'm, I'm terrible. I'm Perfect. right there with you. <laughs> so we're uh, Overwatch <laughs> terrible they anonymous. they hold the guns in the right direction. <laughs> so uh, they've added uh, s some skins here, and specifically to... Uh, Overwatch's events in the past, you still have to buy loot boxes, but you can buy, as far as I know, you can buy the skins that are available, the 12 specific holiday skins, uh, one of which is a Mercy Witch, which is uh, pretty awesome. I am i don't have 3,000 coins to be able to buy it, and I spent like $80 on uh, <laughs> loot crates for the summer games to try to get some stuff, and still didn't get the stuff, the, all the stuff I wanted, which felt really really crappy uh but yeah i don't know i'm 
it's interesting. They've they've added a pl- this amazing huge loot box of stuff. Now, as a you, you and I seem to be casual players when it comes to Overwatch. So, are you interested in dropping more money into the game to try and get some of these really cool skins and then use them before it becomes a little faux pas to use a I don't know, like a Jack the Ripper skin <laughs> in like December? <laughs> Um, I'm mostly a free-to-play player. I haven't actually put any money into Overwatch. Mm-hmm. And it's pretty much what I get from the loot boxes. Because honestly, I like working toward a goal. Mm-hmm. So uh, kind of like in Heroes, where you work toward saving up the gold to buy the hero. And a lot of that uh, requires you to play different parts of the game so like with heroes you know you have to play different types of heroes and everything so that inherently teaches you different parts about it so i like to believe it makes me a bit better as a player but i don't know (laughs) yeah and and these are all cosmetic right so we have to get right out there and say that all of these items that we may or may not be freaking out about are all cosmetic they don't affect the gameplay besides you looking cool at the end of the game when people get to see what uh, how much money you've spent in the game but I, I don't know like i like getting festive in my games so you know when the summer games hit i'm like yes of course i want to play as running tracer i will i will try to get that skin and i tried and tried and and then basically gave up and put money in the system i always say like oh i'm gonna play more you know, because then you level up and you get the loot boxes, and, and I'm level at 27, so I'm still able to level up a decent amount of time, like a, once a night if I were to, like, drop a couple hours in the game. No problem. Whereas some people are level, like, 60, 100 plus, and they have to really grind it out to get that loot box. Um, and, you know, we don't necessarily need to have that conversation again, but I did want to talk about sort of video games using holidays to sort of create these themed events, and I really dig it. And it kind of gives you a reason to go in and say, you know what, I am going to be festive. I'm going to play some Overwatch. And um, the best part about this event is that you don't even have to, like you said, you can be that free-to-play player and still experience the event because I think they've they've redone part of the Hollywood map. It's all like, it's all like Halloweenized. And uh, the first time in the game's history where they have a co-op brawl, which I did play, and we've been talking about this on a while uh, for a while in the gamers end. We want an experience that we can go in and play co-op where we're not competing against other players. We're just sort of on a team. And they've added it and you know, it's not it's not anything to write home about, but it's still really cool and a lot of fun and has this very cool like Reinhardt VO to it. Really neat. Um have you checked out the brawl yet? I know it's just launched I think yesterday, but I did. I, uh, cool. I read the comic and then I saw a video overviewing the brawl itself. So basically, it's this spooky castle mm-hmm. and it's under attack from not Dr. Frankenstein. Uh, <laughs> Junkenstein or something. Yeah, Dr. Junkenstein. <laughs> he, uh, he apparently loved creating uh, robots for the king, but the king didn't like it. So Junkenstein said, well, I'm going to build a monster and show everybody. And he builds the monster. And now they call them, what, the Zom... Zomnix? Zomnix. 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 Yes. <laughs> Some of these skins are really cool. And uh, they actually... And, and this is the other great part about it, in that in the brawl, not only are you experiencing content that you'll probably never get to experience again, maybe until next year when they sort of, you know, add another layer to it, uh, you're getting to experience and play against some of the more fancier skins that you could buy, like Junkenstein, uh, Roadhogs, Frankenstein, uh, Mercy Witch, and Reaper, uh, Jack O' Lantern guy, and Headless Horseman. Yeah, Headless Horseman, and. That's really cool that they've added that in there and be like, you. I now I don't feel like I have to go out and and try to, you know, I like supporting games and I like I think Overwatch is a great game and I know that in exchange for selling these loot boxes, we are getting updated content. Not not to say that everybody has to do it, but I think as long as that one percent still. Not that I'm I'm definitely not the one percent, but uh, <laughs> as long as like. A minority of the the uh, the players are putting money into Overwatch. Blizzard can then go off and say, "Okay, we have X amount of dollars coming in, therefore we can have Y amount of heroes, maps, and patches going out." 
it's a business, so I understand why they're doing it, and I I appreciate it, and I think that um, they could have easily just said we're going to do expansions, and these holiday events are just going to be like like summer games, just sell you some skins. Um, you know, Lucio, the Lucio Ball Brawl or whatever was was cool in concept, but I don't think it really caught on very well. But this this co op brawl is really neat. Three different uh, difficulty mechanics, which is I can only beat it on easy. Medium, I got trounced, you know, and I was with a team of, of higher level players, and we we still we still died pretty handedly. Uh, but yeah, it's just I really like it, and this probably goes back to Warcraft's uh, Halloween stuff, you know. I think ever since Warcraft started doing holidays, I've really gotten into the the gaming spirit of them adding extra layers of coolness for for these holidays. Um, are you? Are you interested in some of these skins, or are you just again like you're just gonna play through and do some some basic Overwatch play and try to get like maybe like a cool uh, tag or something out of this? What are you thinking? Oh goodness! I mean, if you can get a skin, that's amazing mm -hmm. because they it's clear that the team really does spend a lot of time putting these together because all of the little details we see on these, it's just there's a lot of love. I mean. The, the Frankenstein's monster has terror over his belly, and he's got a little pig nose and everything. And then uh, Reaper has the pumpkins on his guns, and Dr. Uh, Junkenstein, Junkenstein. Junkenstein is all cleaned up. He's not as dirty as he was. He's got this new color scheme going on. So I, I love the skins. And I think what I love most about the skins, though, is that it comes from the popular horror culture. So I like to think it prompts us gamers to go back to the source material. Who's Dr. Frankenstein? What's his monster? Who's the headless horseman? Where does he come from? All of yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's like that. Like those two examples right there, like headless horseman and Frankenstein, are sort of classic, like monster mash type stuff. Like you, if you, you know, if you just joined this here Earth and just getting into like Halloween pop culture, you're thinking like, oh yeah, zombies, Walking Dead. I know what you're talking about. Twilight, Sparkles, still cool. It's vampires, whatever. I'm pretty sure they bite people in that, in that series, but, you know, they're... <laughs> I wouldn't be too sure. I don't know if I want to call them vampires either. I think they use that a little lightly. Maybe they're vegan vampires or something. Do they not eat people? Do they not bite into people in that show? I, I've never seen... I think I've watched I think, one. I think the good ones are, are technically vegan. They only drink animal blood or something, but it's That's not. That's vegan, not though? Dracula. <laughs> hmm? That's not vegan if you're killing a... Uh, well, I mean, if you're a vampire, maybe that's what it's considered. Maybe. Uh, you know. Uh, yeah, I guess if... I guess <laughs> if you're on a scale of vampires, it goes like, you know, you kill humans. Vegan, you're just killing, like, deer and stuff. And then extinct, where you're just, like, trying to eat plants. Like, that probably what what vampire scale would be um so yeah no this is this is really cool like rise of the zomnix there's a tag where it's just rise of the zomnix which i want because i'm a huge zombie fan and that just reminds me of the like, old school night of the living dead type stuff uh i gotta stop watching this gift that they have on here because it's just gonna constantly remind me of how many of these i'm not going to get at the end of this um but yeah i think that uh overwatch this is a big improvement on the summer games because i think summer games was just like throw some money at the screen, get some cool skins, and play this cool brawl that we that we put together, which was still cool. You know, it's like Rocket League. It was it was interesting. Uh, but this brawl they put in is kind of like the first experience of they can do co-op stuff, which I'm super excited. I would I would pay for an expansion where there was like single player content and co-op content. That would be really awesome and i can't wait for blizzcon because i think that's going to be one of the things we get where it's more overwatch content you know different overwatch content so yeah i'm looking forward to jumping back in uh with overwatch and i know overwatch halloween terror is not going to count get me out of playing soma or outlast don't worry i will still play those games <laughs> but uh yeah no i i think uh so if I had to ask you, what's your favorite sort of Halloween-themed goodness with video games? Like that added layer, that added sprinkling of Halloween theme, what, what comes to mind for you? 
Oh goodness! So what do you mean? So so, so like, regular you, games that put on outfits? Yeah, or? I think like you you have your WoW, and I might have just taken the two best examples with Overwatch and WoW. And I'm trying to think if there's any other games that do it quite so well. Um, now that I'm thinking about it, I think I, I sort of painted you into a corner with that one because I think WoW does it really well. Overwatch is starting to do it well. Like, is Heroes going to have one? They've had one in the past, haven't they? Not really a Halloween-based one. I think the consensus is that Towers of Doom was going to be a Halloween release, but they had to push it back just because it wasn't ready. Hmm. Um, and in that case, I love the Towers of Doom map. I do too, but yeah. uh, if it has to come down to it, I think the Headless Horseman Hunt in World of Warcraft is mm. probably one of my favorite holiday events. I don't think I've done that one yet. I, I do need to jump back into... Wow, and play some more. Are they are they adding anything to it for Legion or just bumping the level requirement up, do you think? I have no idea, to be honest. I mean, when it comes to me in video games, I hear something's coming out, I go, oh, that's sweet. And then I don't touch it because I don't want to ruin it for myself. Because usually if I watch a preview, I'll immediately form an opinion, whether it ends up being great or not. Oh, that's fine. That's fine. Well, um, I look forward to playing some more Overwatch and trying to unlock some cool skins that uh, some of them are expensive, like the the Witch, uh, Mercy Witch and some of the more top tier ones like Junkenstein and stuff. I think they round out at about 3,000 credits. But some of them are pretty inexpensive. There's some for less than 1,000 credits, like uh, the Reinhardt Mr. Freeze. It's like 750 credits, which is totally attainable. And I will totally buy it if that if I don't have enough credits for anything else, because it looks rad. Um, nice! And isn't there a, a zombie Hanzo or something? There's a zombie Hanzo. There's a, a thriller uh, Soldier 76. There's some oh, that, really that would have to be the one I go for. <laughs> yeah, now that I'm thinking about it, I can actually play Soldier 76, so I think that's, that might be my go-to. Because I don't think I'm going to be able to grind out 3,000 credits by November 1st. That's... That sounds like I would have to take vacation for that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's. I think that's going to do it for our Halloween talk. Man, good chunk of spooky content. But let's not talk about something scary. Let's talk about something cool. Patreon.com slash thegamersin. Thank you, patrons. Because of you, we get some extra content each month. And next week is our patron hangout, which is Thursday night at 8 p.m. Eastern. We'll have details for that going up next week. So patrons, stay tuned. Also, weekly plug for Extra Life, which is happening the week before BlizzCon this year. Uh, we've decided to move it to October 29th. We'll have more details on what we're doing, but the bare minimum is donate to support Children's Miracle Network hospitals around the world by going to bit.ly slash TGI Extra Life 2016, and we will be playing video games for 24 hours. And I gotta say, Kristen, it's gonna be Halloween, so we might have to play scary games. I don't think it's a might. I think it's a question of which ones you are going to be playing. I say 24 hours of the best Oof. horror games you can do. <laughs> because eventually you will be so scared you won't feel fear anymore. There's a point where your body just can't care. <laughs> I think we could start small. And I think maybe this year, this is the year that we retire the Ryan Plays Outlast from 2013 video and we actually play a scary game. I will say right here and now, like if, uh, you know, when donations start to roll in, we will start to kind of come up with some more ideas of what we're going to play and stuff. Uh, the idea we have for sort of donations and uh, player integration is uh, it, there will be ways for people to suggest games in a fun and interesting way that could have us playing some scary games. I will, I will just say that, and when we have more details, probably in the, ne in the upcoming weeks, we'll be able to tell po folks how they can make us play uh, some scary games. Outlast. I think, uh, I think Outlast Jocelyn... DLC. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. You'll be able to add that, I think. Uh, if, 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 if people want to see us play these games, there will be ways for that to happen. I think the only game that Jocelyn has barred is Five Nights at Freddy's because uh, there is enough... Uh, screaming jocelyn video out there to sort of handle that um so anyways yeah go to bit.ly slash tgi extra life 2016 all lower caps and check out the details pick someone on the team donate it goes to a great cause 100 percent of those donations go to uh, the chosen children's miracle network hospital so check that out and that's going to do it that's the show that's the gamers in episode 241 thank you so much 
for being on the show. It's been awesome to talk about scary games. Uh, and I want to give you a chance to let people know where they can catch you playing scary games and uh, Heroes Forge and all that fun stuff. So let everyone know where they can find you. Of course, you can find me at Dream Destroyer. That is D R M D E S T R Y R over at Twitch, Twitter, and YouTube. And then Heroes Forge happens 7 p.m. Pacific Sunday nights over at Oh, here, twitch.tv slash amove TV. Perfect. And then also I have a health and fitness blog, battle to be better dot weebly dot com. Perfect. Yes. That was that started out as the, the BlizzCon, fit for BlizzCon, right? You were doing that and then you've kind of turned it into more of a you know, a, a, a guess not just BlizzCon focused. So that's good. Exactly. There are more conventions than just BlizzCon. <laughs> yeah, it's like I don't go to BlizzCon, so I don't need to be fit. This is perfect. Yeah, exactly. You just keep <laughs> going with that. I'll just sit right here as long as I never go and never have to care. <laughs> well wait, what if you have the virtual ticket? Does that I guess oh. I yeah. Shoot. Mm, well, I should have started earlier. <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I uh, I look forward to. I'm gonna check all that. I will have all the links in the show notes so you can find all of the cool content that's going out there from Kristen. But uh, yeah, you can visit us on the web at gamersinpodcast.com. You can find us on amove.tv along with other shows like The Angry Chicken, uh, Into the Nexus, Overwatchers, and of course Heroes Forge. And you want to follow us on Twitter, you can find uh, Jocelyn at Joss Plays. I have the, I don't know why I put the notes over here. It looks like I'm consulting my notes person, but uh, myself at R. Murphy, Kristen at DRM Destroyer, Destroyer without the E's. You kind of lost some E's there. I know. Well, so here's what happened. I wanted it to be spelled out perfectly. I, yeah, I'm a lover of English language, but when I uh, was creating this, it was already taken. So the spelling fun at the time was to drop vowels left and right. Yeah, so. that's true. As long as you didn't add like X's to the front and back and underscores, you're fine. And it can also go back to like DRM destroyer, like you're an elite hacker and you're destroying exactly. some DRM. So it, it works. Some people think I'm a dorm destroyer, so it works on many levels. <laughs> well, we all had those days in college. We were all there. Exactly. I remember. Uh, but yeah, you can follow the show out at, at The Gamers Inn. We're also on Facebook, YouTube, and all that fun stuff. Speaking of YouTube, you can find all of our videos at youtube.com slash amovetv. Catch up on the older episodes of The Gamers Inn and check out what we've been playing back in the day. Uh, and you can also email the show, info at gamersinpodcast.com. That's going to do it for this week. Thank you very much for joining us, Kristen. It's been fantastic. I love talking about scary games. It's so good. Well, thank you so, so much for having me on. I This was a great, great episode. I love talking about them as well. Awesome. All right. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Have a great week.